Papua New Guinea, the great Stone Age island, is one of the last strongholds of tribal culture. The second largest island in the world, New Guinea is located 100 miles north of Australia and just south of the equator. Papua New Guinea occupies the eastern half of the island. <laughs> The modern age has touched the lives of only a small percentage of women in this country. Most remain virtually frozen in time, enjoying little personal or economic freedom. Overworked and undervalued, they continue to live as their mothers lived and their mothers' mothers before them. In the highlands village of Mendi, ancient mourning customs remain unchanged. Each day these widows, Tama and Salan, coat their bodies with grey river mud. Seed necklaces weighing up to 50 pounds symbolize their burden of mourning. The world of the Mendi widow is thick with ghosts. And this ritual must continue for two years or until a payback or retaliation takes place for the death of their husbands. Tama suspects her husband was murdered by a neighboring clan. My people found my husband's body near the side of the road. I cannot rest until the murderer is found and punished. Only then will my husband's spirit be set free. Throughout the morning period, work will continue. The widows must walk six miles to market, stopping only to quench their thirst. Today they hope to sell 30 cents worth of sugar cane. The marketplace offers women from neighboring villages the chance to socialize and earn a little money for themselves. <laughs> The expression of grief varies from clan to clan, and self-mutilation is not unusual. This woman chopped off her finger when her husband died. The mourning period officially ends with the cleaning and burial of the bones. Only then are the widows free to marry again. A major reason these customs remain unchanged is due in part to the country's rugged geography. Impenetrable high mountains, coastal swamps, and dense tropical jungles separate the island's three million people into 700 language groups, representing one third of all the languages spoken in the world. These language barriers contribute to keeping women in their place. Until today, for example, these young women living in a remote jungle village had never before seen a woman from another race.
Jennifer is a young Highlands girl living in the tiny mountain village of Yopa. From dawn to dusk, she and her mother labor in the garden, harvesting cow cow, a type of yam eaten at every meal. Jennifer says she works hard because even at 14, she knows her worth is tied to how much she produces. Today, she will haul 50 pounds of yams back to her village. Her efforts will determine the size of the bride price her family will receive upon her marriage. Bride price is a payment of money and goods from the groom's clan to the wife's clan in exchange for her services. Jennifer will most likely meet her future husband at a turnum head ceremony, a courtship ritual common to the Eastern Highlands. This erotic sexual event can go on all night. Women who attend must be young and single, but men of all ages, even married men can take part, hoping to find another wife to share the work. While men may take many wives, women are expected to remain monogamous. Oku is the big man or village chief of Jennifer's village. It's time for lunch, and Oku summons his three wives back from the garden. Lena, the first of his wives, returns quickly when she hears his bellowing calls. Her prized pigs are never far behind. At the time of their marriage, Oku's clan paid a bride price to Lena's clan, one stone axe, some feathers, and a handful of shells. Bride price today can be much more elaborate. After 20 years of marriage, Lena is less compliant than Oku's other wives and complains about his constant demands. At one time intensely jealous, Lena has come to depend on the other wives to share the work. The village men have few tasks. There are gardens to clear, huts to build, and fires to start. But much of their time is spent with wantoks, their male friends. At an early age, boys leave their mothers to live in the men's house, a place women are forbidden to enter unless invited. Tonight, the women are allowed inside to celebrate the harvest. But even then, they remain separate. Their plaintive songs express sadness. A woman loses her daughter in marriage to a neighboring tribe. And it is certain that her prized pig will be slaughtered or given away. Women share these losses, and kinship is strong especially in moments of crisis. This woman's beloved friend has died, and word travels quickly when there is a death.
village women console one another over the death of Brigitte Kumana. The men haggle over her worth. Brigitte has served her husband well, tending his garden and pigs, expecting nothing in return. Her father demands that her bride price payments continue. Her husband stalls for more time, claiming his coffee crops are poor this year. You made a promise, and my clan expects you to keep your word. If you can't give us cash, then give us your pigs. We'll see. The issues of bride price and a woman's worth persist, even after death. Far away, in the swampy marshes of the Sepik River, the demands on women are different. There is no land in the village of Kambaramba, no gardens to harvest. The families live in houses on stilts. <laughs> Jeremiah, a master woodcarver, moved his wife, Angela, here to be with his clan, while she finds life in the swamps of Kambaramba extremely difficult. She has no choice. Custom dictates that she live with her husband's family. I work with my husband's mother. She expects a lot from me. Sometimes I'm very tired, but there is little time to rest. My wife cries for her family, but her place is here with me. Each morning, Angela canoes to the mangrove swamps where she collects sago. It's mashed and pounded and cooked into a paste. A coating of river mud cools Angela's skin as she prepares the meal. Gummy and tasteless, sago offers few nutrients, but it does fill the stomach. <laughs> Women also do the fishing. River fish, when they can be found, supplement the family's meager diet of sago with much-needed protein. Pigs are an important sign of status and wealth and share the family's food. In the villages along the upper Sepik River, girls are customarily promised in marriage before birth. At 16, Yeso was grabbed from her sago patch by the aggressive Akro, to whom she had been committed so many years before. She does not question the choice that was made for her. Akro describes how he claimed her for his wife when he decided he was ready to marry. I found her washing yams. I took her hand and led her away. He is a good husband. 
Yeso accepts her marriage just as she accepts other rituals and superstitions. She believes, for example, as do other Sepik women, that she will die if she enters the house Tambaran, the men's spirit house, a place filled with magic and extraordinary carvings, a place where women are not welcome. Superstition and magic are at odds with the teachings of the missionaries who encourage men and women to worship together in the same house. The arrival of Christianity began to shake up old habits and traditions. Polygamy, for example, is forbidden by the church, but is practiced nonetheless in most of the country because tradition is strong and change comes slowly. The church plays an important role in the life of Mary, the village baker. A deeply religious woman, Mary has achieved a degree of economic and social independence, running her own successful business. It's unusual in this country for a husband and wife to work together, mm -hmm. but Mary's husband, John, is content to assist his wife, keeping the logs burning in the steel drum ovens. Together they provide the village with 200 loaves of bread each day, earning enough money to live in relative comfort. Rosa, like Mary, is an exceptional woman. She left her clan to become a computer operator in a nearby town. She returns to her village to attend this important celebration. She considers herself to be a modern Christian woman, but she tells us she can never ignore her tribal roots. This moka, or pig exchange, marks the end of a tribal war that has been going on for 100 years. Although this is a joyous and triumphant occasion for men, it is a sad time for the women in Rosa's village because they must give up their beloved pigs. Caring for pigs isn't a part of Rosa's new life. While she still observes many of her clan's customs and traditions, she made a conscious decision many years ago not to repeat her mother's life. My mother, she does the gardening and looks after the pigs. She domesticates them, looks after my father and the children. And you know, I was one of them that she cared for. But she wanted me to go to school, so that's where I am, and I am in the modernized world. Rosa was asked what she would do if her husband wanted another wife. I wouldn't accept that because I don't like the way that my father has got two wives and you know they grumble and fight and share a man and there's always a family problem to solve that I don't want to be part of it. I don't want to have the same problem. Whereas I got experience from my parents. So you'd only let your husband have one wife? Yeah. If either me or if he wants another one, I leave him. It's one or the other. 
A party of dancers welcomes home Naha Rooney. By any standards, Naha is a symbol of woman's independence. As the only female member of parliament, she is one of the most powerful women in her country. Encouraged by her father to study and succeed, she completed her education at the University of Papua New Guinea. As an important leader, she is equally at home in parliament and with visiting dignitaries, such as Prince Charles, whom she greeted in traditional dress when he visited her home on Manus Island. I am the only woman on the floor of parliament out of 109 members. Mama. At times I feel that I'm misunderstood, not so much of because of what I say, but because one, the traditional society, not only in Papua New Guinea, but throughout the world, do not accept that there will be intelligent women, there are intelligent women, there are women leaders, and there are women who will take up that post. While she thrives on the excitement and challenge of political life, the pull of her home and family is still strong. In her garden, away from the high-pressured world of politics, Nahau wields a bush knife with gusto. Unlike most village women, Nahau has the privilege of working in the garden for pleasure, not for survival. Even a modern woman like Nahau has a bride price. She believes it's a compliment to the woman and that in some cases it's the only time that a woman feels truly valued. Today, Nahau visited with a cousin who had just given birth and described for us a bride price plays a role throughout a woman's life cycle. This is the sago and there's a pig also that will be will take her back, she doesn't go barehand. She goes with food, she goes with the pig so that the husband can take her back and that's the father of the, of the girl and then take her back. And the husband come and bring some money as an exchange. So the bride price is a continuous thing. It doesn't stop at the first marriage. The second child, the third child depends on how the parents feel about their daughter. Continuous payment throughout life, so you're obligated to each other forever. That's my grandmother coming up there. She's a great woman that once she's married four husbands, and she said she, they, she killed all of them, and she's still alive. <laughs> now her grandmother was anxious to see her granddaughter after a four-month absence. While she praises Nahau's Australian husband and the couple's five children, she doesn't quite understand why Nahau is away so much. She said, that's okay, I'm sorry for you for going away all the time, but it's good, you, ca you go and then you bring things and then you help us too in a, in a way, but she's not really happy for me to go away most of the time. Yesterday, the Stone Age. Today, a new world pushing its way into the lives of the women of New Guinea. Naha Rooney, ambitious and educated, is carving a path for those women who choose to follow. For women like Naha, Rosa and Mary, balancing the old with the new brings conflict. Naha recognizes this and cautions the women of her country. It is good for Papua New Guinea that we don't move so fast, so quickly that we lose ourselves, we lose the values and we lose our, our roots. In New Guinea, there's a saying that speaks to the women here. Hurry up em, easy, easy, which means hasten, but slowly.